All right, all right, it's your man. It's your man, Byron A. Lloyd. I'm back. This is Shooting the Breeze with your man, this guy, Byron A. Lloyd. My guest this time around is Maggie Webster, who happens to be my definitive expert. But it's okay if I call you my definitive expert, Maggie? <laughs> sure. Right. She's my definitive expert on death penalty cases in the justice system because, uh, man, she does some really cool, interesting work. And that she's really passionate about. And it's something I'm passionate about. And we're going to touch on that. I'm sure we'll touch on a few things. But we're going to touch on the death penalty because I, my, I would believe that there's many reasons. I don't know. I don't know. What's your stance? Why are you anti-death penalty, Maggie? Uh, well, it's really funny. Uh, I went to school right after high school. I went to college. And I didn't really know what I wanted to be when I grew up. And... I just worked a little job that I could get entry level for a while, mm -hmm. and then uh, my husband was out of town working in New Orleans. We were living in Birmingham at the time, and I ended up watching the West Memphis Three documentary. Wow, really? And that was that was how I got really interested, and uh, I did a little bit of um, charity work, raising some money for them when I was in uh, community college in Alabama and started reading more about it. And I think I came to my position, like a lot of people do, in that, especially with this West Memphis Three case, it seemed to me to be a pretty clear case of innocence. Right, no doubt. And I think a lot of people who end up anti-death penalty start out seeing these injustices where people are uh, arrested and convicted for crimes they didn't commit, and we think, how terrible it would be to be in that position, to be innocent of a crime and not just locked up, but facing death penalty. Right. The more I learned about the process and the more I got into it, the more it started occurring to me that this is not a fair thing for anybody. That even when people do really terrible things, everybody is better than the worst thing they've ever done. Right. Everyone has right. humanity. Um, and I just don't think the state has a place in that, you know. We I don't have, either. I, I, now, by the way, I don't, I don't mean to interrupt, but you know, mm -hmm. me and Maggie know each other from the internet, Facebook, and we missed the first time we've ever spoken, spoken vocally, verbally, anyway, but you know, I was born, you know, I'm born and raised in a town that's like 25 miles from West Memphis. Really? Yeah, you didn't know that? Yeah, look, when all that was going down, I offered them my services. I said I would go do research for them, and they, uh, uh and they uh they de declined nicely, but they declined because they said they had plenty of help. But yeah, man, that was huge. <laughs> hey, that was because man, you start to understand how. Look, I know that story got huge nationwide. You know what I mean? But when it was going yeah. down, when that all that was going down, man, it was huge in the area I lived in. You know what I mean? That's all the man, the rumors, it, the innuendo, the gossip. It was insane. You know what I mean? And uh. uh -huh. And that's just crazy. That's what sparked your interest in the, uh, working in, in the death penalty cases, man. That is insane because uh, those guys are definitely innocent. You know what I mean? And I and I uh -huh. and I can relate a lot to those guys because I'm I'm an odd bird. You know what I mean? And I grew up in a small rural town in Arkansas, twenty miles away. And when you're odd, man, people put the finger on you for for things that you're not really uh, culpable of. You know what I mean? And just like they painted. Uh, they painted them devil worshippers. Man, that was a huge thing back then. I'm talking about people were losing their mind off the devil worship angle. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. But uh, uh, but that's crazy because uh, I didn't know that's what inspired you. And I grew up in the midst of it. And it, let me tell you, it was insane. Well, the part of Arkansas I live in is Arkansas itself. I'm sure Louisiana might be a little more sophisticated. But, you know, Arkansas is fairly backwards. And you know what I mean? People are easily scared. And it's... Uh, uh, it's sad but true that Arkansas is not the, uh, what would I say? It's not a thinking man state. You know what I mean? It's really not. But, uh, well, uh, the, Louisiana's got some pockets. You know, we got New Orleans, right. and we got uh, Baton Rouge, which is a little bit the uh, smaller city, but it's still a city. And uh, right. there's a lot of land. <laughs> right. When you get out where, right, I've been to North Louisiana and you get up in the swampy areas. It's right. It's very. It's it's not much different than South Arkansas. It's like the borders almost merge. You know what I mean? But yeah. you, but you know, there's just a lot of backwards thinking people because they're not informed and they're not edu and they and they don't want to take the time to educate themselves on anything. So that's why you know, like like I said on Facebook, that's why you see all this 
I hate to use the term fake news, but because most of it's coming from the right. But all this stuff, people don't research. They just throw it up there. You know what I mean? They don't. I try to fact check my stuff, and I usually do. I've been caught being lazy a couple of times. But, you know, most people won't even fact check anything. They just threw it up there. And, you know, that's what bothers me, and, it, and that helps corrupt the whole system. And I think the whole legal system is corrupted anyway because there's a lot of innocent people in jail. And, you know, and it all depends on money. Wouldn't you agree? You know, the more money you have. And that's sad, you know, in the greatest country in the world, to get justice or medical help, you need money. You know what I mean? Yep. You'd think that would be two rights. Well, it's supposed to be a right. A fair trial is supposed to be a right, but it don't seem like it nowadays. You know what I mean? We, well, and we don't fund public defense. Right, we, we don't. I know a lot of people I went to school with who are public defenders who are believers in the cause, and they're hard workers, and you know, they, they try to do the right thing for their clients, but right. they have a caseload of 300 cases. Right, they work to death, physically right. physically can't right. work them the way they should be worked. So what happens to a lot of these kids they get locked up, they don't have bail money, if they even get, you know, bail set, they don't get to see their lawyer because their lawyer's overworked, and then uh, the DA will come to the public defender and say, okay, you know, we're not going to go to trials, you're going to just plead guilty and we'll right. have time served. Right. So, even when they didn't do it, a lot of times these are young kids, been away from home for months at this point. What, what are they going to do? Of course they're going to take this deal. Right, they're going to copy plea, right. And that's the what problem they, is now they got a record. Right. So the next time they get in trouble, it's just whether or not they did it, right. and now pe- they're and people now they're don't, back for it again. Right, people don't understand that, man. Copy a plea, you, back in the day, like I would say 40, 50 years ago, copy a plea wasn't a big thing. Most people went to trial. But nowadays, it's almost like 90, it seems like 90% of the cases or something, I forget the statistic, people cop a plea even when they're not guilty. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. And 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 it, first of all, it makes prosecutors lazy. You know what I mean? And they don't do the work they should do. But it makes the, and I hate to say it because defense, paid defense attorneys tend to get lazy, but the, the public defender, man, I watched a documentary on HBO about those guys. Man, those guys are the most uh-huh. overworked people. It's amazing. They don't lose their mind because I, I, I was watching, I think they were a New York uh, uh, de, de, defense attorney, public defender, and he had like 1,100 cases in a year. How is a human being going to work 1,100 cases? You know what I mean? It's physically impossible. Yeah. And you know what I mean? These prosecutors, they have more resources. They get to pick and choose. And they know most of the time people are going to cop a deal. So, you know what I mean? It makes them corrupt and uh, lazy, in my opinion, a lot of the times. You know what I'm saying? But uh, uh, It is. And there, it's a question of resources, too, because right. uh, the states, you know, they're, they're collecting their taxes and they're spending their money on uh, roads and schools and all the things that we need. Right. Only a small portion of that's going to go to the justice system. And so the prosecutors are having to pick and choose. The public defenders are having to pick and choose. Right. And what's happening is the poor people are the ones that are getting caught up in this net. And just like with everything else, they're the ones that are uh, really suffering the most from from these problems. Right. And I, and I say it like I say, uh, and what Jeff Sessions is the attorney general, I don't think it's going to get any better because he seems to have no. such, a, such a 1969 or maybe even 65 look on everything. Because you would, I'm sure you would agree, he's pretty well documented as a racist, and uh, all his beliefs are uh, just so man, just so behind the times, and even his, and, it, and it's so obvious. You know what I mean? He still, he, st- he, you know, he still rant and raves that marijuana is a dangerous drug. You know what I mean? And that he's going to start enforcing that law. And if there's not, and that's a, and that's a big part of the justice system too, is that there's so many nonviolent drug offenders that are clogging up the system, and a lot of them are just addicts that need help. You know what I mean? And they, and now, and I, and I saw, uh, I forget, I saw a, a African American commentator make this point the other day, and it was so true. You know, when the crack epidemic was going down, and black people and Latino and poor people in general were affected the most, they were just throwing them in jail, just warehousing them. But now there's an uh, opioid crisis in white America, especially in rural white America. It's amazing how now that these uh, white government officials, your, your Jeff Sessions, are calling in the illness, you know, a sickness, you know what I mean, a disease. And not as, you know, they're not looking at it from the criminal aspect. You know what I mean? 
It's the same kind of oh, obvious to me. Back, huh? Yeah, it goes back even further than that. There was a sociology class I took in college where we talked about the beginnings of the these wars on drugs. And one of the things that we learned in that class that I didn't know was that uh, back in the, I want to say late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, opium was purely legal, you know, it was absolutely right. legal. Right. It began becoming illegal when the Asians were coming to California and there was a, an uprising from, you know, the Americans against the uh, Asian immigrants. Right. Because the Asians were the ones using the opium and then they decided it was a problem. Right. But in other cities where they didn't have a large Asian population, they weren't calling it a problem. Right, so it's, it's crazy. It's a long history of the problem is not the drug, the problem is who's using the drug. Right. And that's when it becomes what kind of problem? Is it a medical problem or is it a legal problem? Right. And you know, that's a, and I think a lot of people, especially these white working class disenfranchised voters, I believe that uh, they are, they're, right now I think they're disconnected and they don't understand the pain that everybody else has, has felt but they're going to start feeling some of that pain because they voted against their best interest and with the health care bill and some other things, this opioid epidemic, man, they're really starting to, going to feel the effects of that and I think they're going to, excuse my language, but shit their pants, man, when it goes down. You know what I mean? And I think right now, I think right now they're starting to realize they got duped and, you know, that's a big part of it. And in the justice system, it's the same way. You know, uh, you see these mandatory minimums that Jeff Sessions wants to reinstate that have been proven to be not only uh, racially disproportionate, but wrong. You know what I mean? And uh, he wants he wants to bring them back. You know, but, you know when they were making, I forget, you know, when they were making the laws, Bill Clinton, unfortunately, signed the bill in the, bill in the law. But uh, when they, you could get for like five grams of crack, I think it was mandatory 10 years, but you could have... Ten times that in powder cocaine and get less time because it tended that white folks tend to have powder cocaine and the black folks tend to carry rock cocaine. You know what I mean? And uh, right. uh, and Jeff Sessions wants to bring that all back, even though it's turned us into what is it, our prison population is what second or first in the world, right? Uh -huh. And you know what I mean? And we got here because of mandatory minimums, I would say, in my opinion. But it seems like unless you're and I hate to be a conspiracy guy, unless you're, it just ain't much of a conspiracy, but if you're in cahoots with corporate America, you're whacking huts or whatever, who are running these private prisons, and you're AT&T, people don't realize how all these uh, Fortune 500 companies are making money off incarcerating people through phone services, through food services, you know what I mean? And that they got a, they got a vested interest in keeping people locked up, a certain amount of people. And, uh, now it seems like it's going to boom again, you know what I mean? And I wonder when people are going to realize yeah. how many people's locked up. You know what I'm saying? It's not even just an interest in it. It's contractual. Right. It, it's written in the private prison's contracts that they have to have all the beds filled or the state has to pay a penalty. Right. Or the federal government, depending on who, you know, what population they're serving. Uh, Man, how's yeah, that legal? Exactly. Man, how's that? I didn't know that. Man, that sounds like some total illegality to me. Man, that sounds like... Well, that's forced quotas, you know what I mean? Well, of course uh -huh. they're going to arrest more people because we know the state ain't going to pay money they don't have to unless it's something that benefits whoever's running things. Wow, I didn't know that. That is insane, man. How is that legal? It's amazing how people have interpreted, how the co people who interpret the Constitution have twisted it over the past 20 years, especially on the conservative side, you know what I mean? You know, they claim to be the patriots and whatnot, but they seem to be the ones that are leeching away our rights more than anybody. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, we have uh, Angola and Louisiana as our big state uh, penitentiary. And yeah. Angola is a state-run facility. It houses about 5,000 men. Wow. Uh, and it's a long-term facility. So you don't go to Angola necessarily unless you have either a life sentence a virtual life sentence or a really, really long sentence. Now they have, because they closed down another prison, they do have one camp at Angola and now that is uh, housed with people who have lower sentences. But typically, right. the majority of your population is going to be white right. right. And the programming at Angola, you know, Warden Kane was our big warden. Uh, he's recently retired. Uh, before him was Warden Whitley. Warden Whitley came in, and I 
Mongolia is notorious for being horrific, just horrific conditions. Well, I've and seen a documentary. It looked horrible. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, in the 70s, there was a group of men who cut their own Achilles tendons to protest oh my God. the conditions. Uh, oh, my God. Holy yeah. crap. I mean, was, wow. Go ahead. I'm sorry. That was the, wow. the better solution. Wow, yeah, it tells man. you how bad it was. Wow. Yeah, there's stories of, like, everybody sleeping with a shank because you just didn't know what was going to happen. Wow, so, man. So, Warden Whitley came in in the early 80s, and he really did a lot of good in that prison, turning it around, making it a safer place. Not right. a good place to live. It's still prison. Right. I don't want anybody to listen and think, you know, I mean, that they're being coddled. Right, It wasn't yeah. as unsafe as it used to be. Right. And he also added in a lot of programming. So guys could get their GEDs, they could get training in different programs. And Warden Kane, when he took over, he continued that tradition. He said, you know, you got to treat prison like a camp. You got to keep these guys occupied right. so that they're not, you know, getting into trouble. Which makes keep sense. Keep them busy, they're not going to get in trouble. Right, which makes so sense, they, man. Mm-hmm. But, but I was going to say, real quick, they're like, I just want to say real quick, how many people you think are, well, I don't, you probably know exactly, but how many people are in death row you think in Angola? Because I've seen a documentary, and there seem to be a lot of death row inmates in there. You know what I mean? Uh, I haven't looked in a couple of years, but I want to say it's in the mid-80s. So it's around 85 people. It's not an exact number. Because right. uh, I know that there have been several people that have been moved off the road recently. Right. Uh there were two cases out of Caddo Parish, which is Shreveport, Louisiana, that were overturned. Uh, one got a new trial uh, and got a life sentence. The other one, his death sentence was overturned, but his conviction was not. And uh, the DA that was elected decided not to seek death again. Right. So now those two got moved off. I want to say there was an innocence case fairly recently maybe moved off, but I could be wrong on that. Um, so I want to say there's about 85, and there's two women at the women's prison that are on really? death row. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I guess it, well, it's blows my mind, because I believe we do got one woman on a death row. I think we executed a woman a couple of years ago, but we our new governor, Asa Hutchison, well, he's a jackass, man. He used to be the drug czar, and he was in a... Uh, Oh, he truly is a jackass. Him and his brother, politician, they're, they're career politicians. They've run for everything. You know what I mean? They're like, mm-hmm. they've run for everything you can run for, man. They take turns being state and U.S. senators. But he was made drug czar under George Bush. You know, Bill Maher humiliated him. You know, uh, uh, for, uh, it might have been uh, that documentary he did about religion, but Bill Maher humiliated him. It made him look like the idiot he is. Well, now he's the governor, and he's the one that's really decided to kick the death penalty, you know, he's supposed to be a real big Christian, too, which always blows my mind how Christians can condone killing people. But uh, how they have no problem in that. There's no moral, there's no more uh, interpretive uh, interpret- or nothing. But uh, what, he uh, is the one who's decided to kick it in overdrive. And, you know, we've tried to kill eight dudes. I think it was eight people. That last podcast I did about it, I think it was eight people. And they whittled it down ended up killing four, maybe six. Yeah, but, but I didn't follow it as closely as I usually do, but I know it was a lot, and then the Supreme Court had overturned right. or stayed some of those executions, but several of them still went forward, I knew that. Right, and and one of the guys, and this is a big thing that really bothers me, it bothers me that the, that the state thinks they have the right to kill anybody, because first of all, from what I've read, it's more expensive to to kill somebody because of the, the legal appeals, that, or try to kill somebody. And uh, uh, then to give them life in prison. And I always say, I'm sure you've heard me say it, you know, I, for financial reasons, moral reasons, legal reasons, all of them, to me, make sense in doing away with the death penalty. And, uh, and one of the big reasons, uh, this is a big reason, is because people who are mentally challenged or are mentally disabled, Arkansas is like Texas. They have no problem killing these people when they're obviously mentally disabled. You know what I mean? And, they, and one of the guys... One of the executions that they done in Arkansas last month or the month before, one of the guys who had a real t- rough time of it because they're using drugs. You know, they got these new cocktails of drugs because all their other drugs have been made illegal, or they won't. The companies won't let them import them. So now they're trying all these different drugs, and they're just like doing it on the fly. Well, dude, dude seized up and had a real rough time of it. The guy was mentally disabled. It was proven that, but they had no problem. 
no problem at killing this guy. And I say kill him because executing makes it sound too nice, too clinical. When well, it's basically state sanctioned murder, in my opinion. You know what I mean? It is. It's homicide. Right. Because there's no it's difference. It's the most in the... premeditated of homicides. Right. And once again, that we could get into the legal, you know, my your legal views, and I'm sure mine are, are pretty close. And you know, because that gives us, that makes the state above the law. And, but there's many other legal reasons because we know the justice system is corrupted. And there's a lot of, and you know, I hear my conservative buddies say they act like everybody in prison is getting pina coladas and watching cable TV. And you know, it may not like they're being really coddled. You know what I mean? You hear Republicans, yeah. man, and they're sounding like, oh, man, they got it. I wish I had it that good. You get three meals a day, cable TV. Yeah, but you also get brutally raped. The chances of you getting stabbed or killed are pretty high at any moment. You know what I mean? The paranoia yeah. the paranoia you probably live with is probably mind and probably drives you crazy. But other than the whole brutal rape and murdering part, other than that, it's pretty nice. You know what I mean? The bunks are soft. The food is great. You know what I mean? These people, you know, when I, it blows them out when I hear people say it, but... What I was saying is that uh, there's a lot of innocent people on death row because they didn't get a fair uh-huh. shake. And I forget, I'm sure you watched that show. I just watched it, and his name is slipping my mind. That dude in Oklahoma who's obviously uh, is on death row for no reason. You know what I mean? Well, he, he was in on a robbery, but the dude that done the killing stitched, put it on him and took a deal, so he's got the death penalty for it. You know what I mean? And it's so obvious that he probably did that he probably had nothing to do with it whatsoever. But, uh, you know what I mean? When you start relying on uh, co-conspirators, you know, testimony, that's another problem I have. Or when you start cutting deals so people are are compelled to make up evidence against other people. You know what I mean? I have a big thing about that, too, because who wouldn't lie to save their life? You know, that's basic survival. You know, that's basic survival mode. Who wouldn't do that? And when that, that just blows my mind how easily nowadays they'll take the word of a co-conspirator and, and crucify the guy who might have done less or nothing at all. You know what I mean? Yeah, and what we have seen on some of the, uh, the cases, especially when there's a group right. uh, that have some ill intent and they intend to go out and commit a crime, they will pull in somebody that they know Right. To join them that is slow and you know, intellectually disabled. And right. then if they get caught, then they blame that person. Right. West Memphis 3. Yeah. Look at West Memphis 3. They made their whole case of Jesse Miss Kelly. And he definitely was mentally disabled. You know what I mean? Absolutely. You know Absolutely. what I'm saying? And the whole interview with that guy, they pressured that guy. Man, it was horrible what they did. Then they fed him all the info. But, but, you know, people don't realize who, who, who wasn't here locally. So I hate to just jump on a tangent on that case, but that case was screwed up on so many levels. You know what I mean? I'm sure they teach that in law, law school now. You know what I mean? It's one of those type of cases. But uh, uh, when they brought him in that room and just fed him the information, people don't realize this, but it went around It went around the local areas that uh, that kid was so mentally disabled and that uh, the, the cop who done all the interrogating... Before that thing went to trial, man, the day of the day they got the first verdict, that dude he would never do an interview. I forget his name. He was the ball headed guy. I forget his name. But the day they got the first conviction, that dude retired and moved off. You know what I mean? Never heard from again because he uh-huh. knew he knew it was a you know he knew the fix was in. You know what I mean? And that happens a lot. The fix is in a lot, and the cops a lot of times. And I'm I watch another I watch. Uh, uh, was it another 48? Not another 48. That's the Nick Nolte movie. The one on A&E where it's always murder, guys on murder. It used to be Memphis. Uh, yeah. First 48. 48. Hours. Yeah, first, first 48. 48. There it goes. Man, I'm burnt some brain cells. My memory's failing me. But, uh, 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 <laughs> but uh, uh, the first 48, you know, it is insane because nine times out of ten, they don't really do no police work. They just get a dude to snitch. You know what I mean? Nine, uh-huh. And that's what happens nine times out of ten. Some dude snitches, and it's usually some dude that's already in jail who's compelled to snitch, so they'll lessen his charges. And I don't, that just seems, that, I don't think it should be allowed in court because, it, like, like just like the quotas you were talking about in, that, in the prison contracts were, which is shocking to me, 
But that just seems like a, uh, it, it just sniffs on illegality, man, because of course somebody's going to lie. Who wouldn't? You know what I mean? I try to be an honest guy, but if I was facing life with a death penalty, and they said all I got to do is point my finger at this guy and they'll knock it down to 10 years or something, man, I'll point two fingers at that guy. You know what I'm saying? Sure. And it just blows my mind. And I don't know if I mentioned it or you can mention it, but I forgot to ask you. what. Tell tell the people what you do. I forgot. When I, I just I just announced you as my expert. But, uh, <laughs> uh, so I am a mitigation investigator, and what that means is, cool. is uh, when you have a capital case and it's being tried as a death penalty case, you have the penalty or you have the guilt phase, the guilt innocence phase, and it's the first part of the trial, and it's like all the other ones that you see on TV where the state puts on their evidence and right. the defense rebuts. And then the jury decides if you're innocent or guilty of this crime. If they decide you're guilty, in Louisiana, 12 hours later, they have to begin the penalty phase. So it it begins, like, right after. I mean, it's the next well, day. Well, it is the next day. Uh, and the rules of evidence are a little more relaxed because the United States Supreme Court said in the 1970s when they brought back the death penalty that... You have to be able to reserve the death penalty for the worst uh, offenders of the worst crimes. Right. And so it's supposed to be very narrowly you know, applied to people. It's only supposed to be for these really, really terrible crimes, and it's only supposed to be for these really, really terrible people. Right. So my job is to uh, interview a client, interview the family, put together the social history of the client, uh, collect their medical records, their school records, uh, anything and everything that has ever been documented about the client we try to get. And then through that, we try to show who this person is and how they got to this place. That's cool. And hopefully to show the jury that this is not one of the people that is deserving of the death penalty. Uh, that there is enough humanity there uh, right. that he's not one of the worst of the worst right. and that he's going to get a life in prison. I think a lot of people, um, because it used to be, if you have a life sentence, not a death sentence, but a life sentence, you were eligible for parole in, if not all jurisdictions, most jurisdictions. That changed in the mid-90s, I want to say by 1996, no state in the country had a life sentence that didn't mean life. Right. So, in Louisiana, and in Arkansas, and most other, you know, all other places, Especially if the you South, get I'm a sure. life without parole, it means you are never getting out. Now, you could apply for a pardon, but that's a very political process, yeah. and governors are not particularly excited to let somebody out who has been convicted of a crime like this. Uh, because of fear of the political blowback. So, yes, technically, they could potentially, you know, petition to be released on a pardon, but that is not likely, and I can't think of a case where that has happened. Right, like I said, I got these, I got these death penalty statistics, and I, I'm trying to see what it, it's from a website, Statistics Brain, which is pretty good, pretty decent website, but I'm looking, I'm trying to see how far they go back, but they tell the amounts, the amount of cases who have been, that have Asked for and gotten clemency, and uh, uh, man, it's not many at all. You know what I mean? Let's see. It says, uh -huh. oh, I guess it's from nineteen. This is this comes from nineteen seventy six to present day. There's been thirteen hundred ninety two executions, and uh, uh, oh, clemency. Let's see, number of clemencies only two hundred sixty eight. Jesus Christ! And like you said, for most of the time, it's political because nobody wants to be seen pardoning or letting a murderer go free, you know what I mean? It's political death. But, man. Right, that's and clemency that's is crazy. a little different from a pardon. Because right, a pardon's a full pardon. Typically means, right. clemency just usually means you get a life in prison instead of being executed. Right, And right. usually there's a reason for that. So, right. in the early 2000s, the Supreme Court came out and said, you cannot execute someone who is uh, intellectually disabled. Right. Can't execute, you know, in layman's terms, somebody that's mentally retarded. Uh, you still get away and, with it. Go ahead. And... Well, the problem with that decision is that the Supreme Court did not lay out a bright line test right. for who qualifies as intellectually disabled. So, 
so they've left it up in the States. And it's a two-pronged test. They test your IQ, and it also has to be from childhood. So you can't get a uh, head injury later in life that leaves you intellectually disabled, and that will pardon you from death penalty. It has to be something that's well-documented, you know, or something that you've had for a very long time. Yeah, not something that just happened. A full pardon means you just walk away. Or where you'd walk away, you get exonerated, they let you out, right? Is that how it works? Right, right. And those are very, 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 very Because I, mean, I, hate, I hate referring back to the West Memphis 3, but I, I know a lot about that case, but I know they took the Alford plea, you know what I mean? Right. Which is, which yeah. is some they, kind of legal limbo. Right, which is a bit, which is bull, excuse my language again, bullshit. It's one of those deals where the state won't admit they screwed up because they're scared of lawsuits, basically, at this point. You know what I mean? Because, especially in the case of Arkansas, because those guys definitely had multi-million dollar lawsuits. They could, they should have got money for it. But because uh, I forget, Damien Eccles was raped a lot of times in jail. You know what I mean? I know of at least a half dozen that were discussed around the area. You know what I mean? That, that's sad. That case is so well known when he got raped. You know, it, it would make the rounds in Arkansas. People would know about it. That's twisted but true. You know what I mean? But, yeah. uh, because that kid, kid was hated. They were all hated, but especially that kid. But, uh, uh, man, that blows my mind. It, uh, just blows my It's just the whole system to me seems corrupt. And, you know, when it comes to the legal system, there's some good parts about it that you can see how people could be passionate for it. Like what you do is so awesome. Because it's making a difference. You know what I mean? You're trying to save lives. You know what I mean? That's something. That's something to get behind in my book. Trying to save lives instead of take them. You know what I mean? And uh, uh but uh, uh, it just blows my mind how uh, uh, anybody can get railroaded nowadays. Anybody, and that's what I don't. I think people don't understand. If they found themselves in the right situation, they could end up on death row and be innocent. And you know what I mean? Yep. Unless they were a multimillionaire, and in, in, in cases there, I'm sure there've been multimillionaires falsely accused. I'm sure it don't happen often. I don't think O.J. was falsely accused or Robert Blake or, you know what I mean? Or, uh, or uh, what's old dude that was in the, uh, oh, man, not a, he wasn't in DuPont, even though that DuPont dude was crazy. He, oh, Robert uh, Durst, that whack Robert job. Durst, yeah. That whack job. That was one of the greatest, if not the greatest TV series ever produced. You know what I mean? That was, that was pretty shocking. Well, wasn't it, though? You know what I mean? How a dude that has so many... M- Mental problems. He obviously had so many. Not, not even to mention the nervous tics he had, which were odd. Mm-hmm. But he had so many obvious mental problems, from being narcissistic to at the same time being delusional. He had a bunch of things going on. How he kept it together for forty years and never got busted. Before he busted, <laughs> before he busted himself out while he's taking a leak. Right. How you know what I mean? It makes you wonder if he wanted to get caught at that point. You know what I'm saying? Because you would mm-hmm. think. If he could keep a secret for forty years, how could he keep? Why could he keep it for forty more minutes? This is mind blowing. You know what I mean? I've never seen nothing like that. You saw it at the end, didn't you? He starts I burping. Did, yeah. It's insane. The dude starts. I've never seen anybody uncontrollably burp like that. First of all, you know what I mean? Which is extremely odd because dude's like, ur, 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 ur. you're like, what is going on? Dude's like, I got to take a leak. And for people who ain't seen it, man, if you've not seen The Jinx with Robert Durst on HBO, you're depriving yourself of one of the most odd and strange things you will ever see in your life. And it is shocking beyond shocking. You know what I mean? Even though I've been watching, have you seen The Keep? You got, I'm sure you watch Netflix. You, uh, uh, have you seen The Keepers? Have seen- I have. How wild is that? That's right up there with The Jinx. That is shocking that was- beyond shocking. That was an excellent, uh, excellent program. Uh, oh, it they, was, they did man. a really good job with the investigators. It, it was. On that. And, you know, that's what I keep... And the reason I'm bringing up these shows, uh, people, is because uh, these are all... These are all feelings in the justice system that have been documented. And, man, the keepers, I don't want to spoil it for people because it's still out there new. And the jinx has been out there for a while, and everybody knows Robert Durst got busted. But, uh... uh which he's about to go to trial, I believe. But, uh... uh but he looks horrible. I just saw a picture. He looked like he's aged really bad. But he wasn't, you know, the handsomest of men to begin with. But, uh... Well, Jay will do that to you. Yeah, they age the hell out of you. It's crazy when people talk about uh, how good the prisoners have it. Right. Yeah, take you, a look at anybody that's that. Especially when you know, you're elderly. Six to eight months. 
or more in a jail. You know what I mean? It, it's not a great place to be. Right, because right because people don't realize you're living on pins and needles at the the whole time, and especially if you're an elderly person like Robert Durst. Now I know that in that series they bragged that he had bought protection in his last prison stay, and I'm sure he's probably buying protection now. But just the just the stress of the everyday stress will age you so fast in jail. You know what I mean? Plus, you're not getting proper medical care. The food is shit. You know what I mean? They're feeding you unhealthy. They're feeding you unhealthy bullshit. A bunch of carbs and sugars. You know what I'm saying? But uh, yeah. but the keeper is just so shocking because and look, I believe it says this in the uh, description, so I can put this out there. It's about a nun who got raped and killed allegedly. They go back and investigate the case, and it's just a Pandora's box. You know, they pull on the proverbial sweater string, and it just keeps unraveling. But the amount of and I don't want to say this to discourage anybody from watching it, because they make it very interesting to investigate. Like she, like Maggie just said, the way they laid it out in the investigative process of that was genius. You know what I mean? And it was really special. I've never seen it in a documentary done like that before, except maybe Earl Earl Morris. But uh, there's a lot of kid rape in there, and it's amazing because of the just the depth and scope of the child rape that we get, they get away with that people got away with. You know what I mean? I, mm-hmm. I don't want to spoil it for folks because I want to talk about it because it is unbelievable. It will, Like I said, I, I watched it. I, I didn't know it was a series. I didn't know it was like making a murder with a guy, the guy who's mentally challenged. If you testified against him, I forget his name. The guy who killed the girl at the scrapyard. I didn't make it a murder. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I tried to get into out. that. I tried to get into that. But that guy wasn't that sympathetic of a character, man. So I never finished watching all that because he seemed... He seemed kind of creepy to me, and I don't—I don't think he killed it the second time. I do believe he probably did it the first time, but he's getting the shaft. But you know, Netflix got caught up in a bunch of legal, uh, legal problems with that. You know what I mean? They used a bunch of that Netflix footage against that guy. But the but the keepers, man, I thought was done. First of all, it's a sympathetic character. You know what I mean? You want somebody you can empathize with, and who can't empathize with the most popular nun at a Catholic school who was brutally raped and killed? You know what I mean? For, cause from, from all accounts, she was a great human being. You know what I mean? And that Avery yeah. guy just ain't that appeasing of a character. You know what I'm saying? And uh, uh, Well, I, I didn't finish it either. Uh, but the reason I didn't finish it, when I was in school, I did a uh, paper on false confessions. And I spent a lot of time doing a lot of research. And, That's uh, a big thing, I too. I interviewed... Uh, the head of the Innocence Project in New Orleans for my paper. Wow. And when they started coercing his nephew, Brendan, uh, and elicited that false confession, it was so infuriating to watch, I never went back. I turned that episode off and I never finished it because... That's I crazy. Hey, did you turn the episode... What much. episode did you stop watching on? Was it the one where his mentally challenged nephew turns on him? And they pretty much get a false confession out of it because that's where I stopped watching it too. Uh, cause that's that, exactly. Christ, <laughs> crazy because that's exactly where I stopped watching it. Because first of all, it pissed me off. The guy would It was hard for me to watch anyway, like I said, because Stephen Avery was the most empathetic character. You know what I'm saying? Right. He seemed kind of creepy, but being creepy ain't against the law, and you shouldn't get you know death penalty for being creepy. Uh, but he was kind of creepy. But uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? But that's not against the law. But. I got so mad because it was so obvious his 16-year-old nephew or whatever. It was just like the West Memphis 3 all over again. They were spoon-feeding him in the answers. They were scared. It was just like Jesse Miss Kelly. They knew they had somebody who was feeble-minded, and they put applied yeah. incredible amounts of pressure and scared the living shit out of him, and then fed him the, fed him the answers. You know what I mean? Which he didn't get uh-huh. right. Just like Jesse Miss Kelly, he kept misanswering things, and they wouldn't even correct him on his misanswers that they'd already fed him. You know what I mean? He couldn't even get the answers right, even after they fed them to him. And it was so obvious. But uh, uh, now I'm, I think they were trying to do a part two of that deal because a bunch of what Netflix did got caught up in the legal entanglements and they used evidence or clippings from Netflix in court against the guy. But I don't know, but The Keepers is phenomenal. I was, Like I said, I didn't know it was a series. Somebody mentioned watch it. Because, I, like I said, I'm still disabled recovering, so i got plenty of time to watch stuff. And so I went and watched it. Man, I was so addicted. I, wa- I binge watched it one day. You know what I mean? I could not stop watching it. I couldn't stop watching it. You know what I mean? Because every chapter was more shocking. Am I right? You're like, yeah. I, man, here, okay, screw it. Spoiler alert. You're like, man, cops. Cops are in on it. 
Oh, man, oh, it was unbelievable. You know what I mean? I said spoiler yeah. alert, people. Most people, hey, if you ain't seen it by now, you're lame anyway. But it was priests and cops, the last two dudes who were supposed to be molesting kids. You know what I mean? And they were molesting the shit out of them. I'm talking about it was horrible. You know what I mean? And got away yeah. with it. That's what gets me is because the Catholic Church is big on sweeping that stuff under the under the rug. The, the years and decades they get away with it. Just like in the movie Spotlight, you know, when they focus on the Bo the Boston area Catholic churches and the uh, diocese that uh, uh it's amazing they get away with it for decades because uh, and say I got a real personal deal with that when I was twelve I I I I've said it before in my podcast I had a guy follow me that was a youth minister you know what I mean that was in the Big Brother program you know what I mean so it freaked it freaked me out because nobody believed me because they was a youth minister so I shut up about it you know what I mean when I shouldn't have and it bothered me because I didn't I thought years after that I wonder how many other kids he followed because I didn't say nothing you know what I'm saying. And I went through some guilt over that, man. And, you know, that's just being open. That's just honest disclosure. And a dude found him a junk, man. And, uh, you know, I, I, it was 20 or 30. I was 25 or 30 years old before I could openly admit it. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, it wasn't my fault. Dude's a freak. I wish I knew where that dude lived. I'd throat punch him. But I just felt a lot of guilt because, you know what I mean? He said that was the only time i ever done it. But I don't know that. You know what I'm saying? And he could have been, a, you know, he could have went on and, Done way more horrible things. I, I I stopped him immediately as he come as soon as he touched my junk, I shut it down. You know what I mean? But uh, because uh, I was twelve, I went to screaming. No, I shut it down. I was screaming like, like a damsel in distress. I went to screaming and freaking out. But uh, like you're supposed to, man. You know what I mean? Uh, but a lot of kids get scared. And don't and then, you know? I I, I still I didn't speak up like I should have. So I feel bad in that sense, and, I, and that's why when I see something that has to do with Anybody should be empathetic or victimized anybody, especially children that are victimized, especially by people of authority. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. But then as you get older and wiser, you realize, well, that's where that's where child molesters and pedophiles go because, uh, you know, just like uh, people who love ice cream go to the ice cream shop, people who love kids are going to go to where there's kids. You know what I mean? And that's a shame. Yeah. And that's a shame. And it's, uh, it just blows my mind that they get away with it for so long and it's so widespread. You know, I believe we only see maybe a tenth of that. You know, only a tenth of the actual these molestation rate. And I say molestation like I'm like a mollusk, like I'm. I, was, I drew that out like a country dumbass molestation. Anyway, molestation, but it's so widespread that we only see a tenth of it that gets brought into the light. That I think we would be shocked as a nation if we realized how uh, regular that, how regular occurrence that is. You know what I mean? And it's sad it's that way, and it bothers me. Just like this bothers me. But we're at, I forgot to tell you, we're at minute 43 and a half. And uh, if you want, we could do it. I was hoping you'd come back and do a part two with me. Would you do that? Absolutely. Okay. And uh, uh, Because uh, I'm going to try to put two parts out, but I was hoping uh, uh, we'll come back and do part two. This is Shooting the Breeze with your man, Byron A. Lloyd. This is Maggie Webster, and we'll be back.